Aloha and welcome to Holistic Wellness Revealed. I'm Letitia Sharp and I'm your host today as we discuss the difference between conversation, conscious conversation, and talking. My guest today is Marisha Murnowska. She's an herbalist, a medicine woman, and the director of the School of the Sacred Wilds. So grateful to have you on today, Marisha. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you and aloha. <laughs> aloha to you. You're in California, right? I am indeed. <laughs> beautiful. It must be a beautiful time of year there with everything blossoming and growing and yeah, we had a really good rain this winter, which has been a blessing. So the mountains are happier and, you know, we're getting into that dry time, which which can be a time of nervousness as, as fire season approaches. But we're feeling super blessed to have had a good rain. So hopefully we'll be we'll be safe and the land will continue to feel nourished and green. <laughs> Right. So you have that, um, that baseline, right. <laughs> of, oh, the, the earth has been saturated. So that's really nice. And I guess that really kind of takes us into the topic today is being able to have that conscious conversation with the earth, with each other, with, um, the planet, even with ourselves, um, what does the difference between talking and conversation mean to you? Oh, it's such a rich and great question. I'm so glad that we'll be diving into this. You know, I feel like talking often is unconscious to a certain degree. Um, there's often kind of either some reactivity that can be at play more. Um, sometimes when we're talking, we're having our old wounds being triggered. And we might be also kind of regurgitating ways of speaking and communicating that our parents used to talk or, you know, authority or teachers. Sometimes when we're talking, there can be power dynamics that are also really kind of unhealthy and, and funky. And it's really incredible to look at communication as a spiritual practice because what we say becomes matter and and sound vibration never ceases to exist. I mean it's completely incredible but you know the big bang and and also every prayer that has ever been spoken is literally still in the air around us. Sound doesn't dissipate that vibration lives on forever. And so when we bring a little bit more awareness when we use tools to calm our nervous system and ground and connect to the consciousness of the earth and, and to a high, our own higher consciousness, then we can communicate in a way that creates magic and medicine and, and beautiful relationship. We can communicate in a way that is empowering and that is reflective of, of our own deepest truth. I love that. I mean, I had a full body chicken skin happen as you were speaking how towards how sound and prayers there they live forever, right? And I mean, I even can think of times in my life when I was just like, "Oh, I can't take that back." Like I can't unsay that. Um and then I've had some, you know, deep remorse for some of the ways that I've spoken in in this life so far and so it is bringing awareness to that and allowing yourself to actually be in conversation with people which to me also i i mean talking almost feels one-sided too right whereas yeah. conversation is this reciprocal kind of dance that you do with each other with other things um, other living things, which everything is alive, right? Yeah, I, you know, what you were speaking to about that remorse that maybe we experience when we say something, it reminds me of a, of a saying that we often say as, as witches, wor words create worlds and words can destroy worlds. So again, just emphasizing the power of, of speaking, 
you know, even spell casting, right? It has the word spelling in it, you know, words, even in the Bible, it says, and then there was the word, right? So there's a lot of ancient um, myth, mythos, um, spirituality, a lot of history that, that kind of can ground us in an awareness of how powerful our, our words are. And, and to your point, communication doesn't have to be verbal. Communication is this exchange. Uh, when I think of communication, I think of deep listening as, as an integral component. And so, you know, when we are in conscious communication or in, in deep communication with a human, there's this almost like a third presence, which is the spaciousness. And, and typically these kinds of communications can move slower so that we don't go into kind of automatic or reactive or scripted response. We want to down-regulate our nervous system and stay in the body and connect to our heart and connect to our solar plexus and our truth and our breath and, and allow there to be this, this kind of um, exalted seat for deep listening. What am I saying? What are you saying? And what is not being spoken verbally, but is present in the space? Right. And one way to be able to continue that reciprocity is questions, right? What I heard was this. Is that what you meant? Right. And and just having that be, that's so friendly. <laughs> that's so friendly to be able to say something like that and non-judgmental. It's like, wow, this is what I heard. And most times I would say maybe eight to nine out of 10 times, what people are hearing is not what people are intending to be heard. <laughs> Absolutely. I think what you just offered is such a great um, technique, especially for couples and in relationships, um, or especially when we're having those harder conversations or feeling more tender and vulnerable. It's so helpful to reflect back, you know, this is what I heard. Is that correct? Is that what you meant? Um, and and um, yeah, it's it's amazing. And that's a skill, right? I mean, what we're talking about conversation as opposed to scripted talking or trauma dumping talking or any of those things, um, it, it's a skill, and it's something that most skills need to be practiced. And so in practicing, we can mess up, right? And we got to love ourselves through that. <laughs> got to love ourselves through yelling at our five-year-old because we're late and they're late and they're just looking in the mirror and dancing and they don't care about time, <laughs> right? And so like I've had to forgive myself and love myself through certain moments of, um, of, of things like that. So definitely practicing that skill, right? Yeah. And to that, you know, in that example, I think it's powerful when our kids witness us taking ownership and taking responsibility and apologizing. And I think, again, this conversation of, you know, language talking, it's probably one of the more impactful ways that we can change culture, that we can change how we relate to our children, to one another, that we can change our whole society. Um, and so, you know, I know in my parents' generation, apologizing to the kids, especially coming from Poland and Europe, it's just not done. There's some kind of like authority, and, you know, thing where, where it's not done. And so for me, I have this opportunity to create a different kind of culture in my family where we can all mess up and we can all take accountability and we can all forgive um, and, and I'm modeling that to my daughter so that she can really be responsible for how, uh, for when she messes up. Thank you for, for talking about that because it wasn't until my daughter was 12 that I was really able, that she really taught me <laughs> how important that was. And that you know what? It's just not okay. It's not okay for you to dictate. That's not where we're at anymore. That's not the kind of human that I want to steward 
um, and support into growing to be one of the adult humans that, you know, carry on on this planet after we're going to be gone. So, and, and having more children. So it is, it's a cycle breaker. And I feel like there's a, there's a lot of things that we can learn from our kids, whether we have kids or not, it could be our nephews, our nieces, or maybe you're a teacher and you have kids. So yeah, it's, it's a huge component of the growth and the healing of humanity. Yeah. So um, what are some of the places where we feel where talking originates in our body and where conversation originates in our body and how, like, how does that feel in your body? Because I like to bring it back to something that people can grab onto, like maybe some kind of an example of where, oh, you realize you're just talking, you're not really communicating and having a conversation. Um, I know where that feels like to me, I'm interested to hear how, where does that, where do you feel that come up in your body and how does it feel? Yeah. It's a double question. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, some of, there are some things that we can look out for when we're having, especially a difficult conversation um, to kind of help us see where we're at. Um, if we start to talk faster or louder, that's usually a sign that we're moving away from deep compassion and embodied truth. Um, if we start to think about what we're going to say next when the other person is still talking, which is very common, <laughs> that's another great sign that we really need to slow things down if we want to be in um, a conversation and if we want that conversation to be deeply medicinal and, and productive and revealing of, of the greater truth. And I think, you know, um, when I'm in a conversation that's really vulnerable or difficult um, and I'm practicing some of the skills of conscious communication, um, I do certain things before the conversation to prepare myself. Mm -hmm. I often will burn a little bit of a blessing herb, light a little sage, or um, just something, some kind of a, an incense, something to help clear the space. And these, you know, there are so many ancient herbs like white sage or copal, palo santo. These are some of the more kind of popular ones right now, but even the local herbs around us, dried rosemary, dried mugwort, um, burning or, or pine resin, Burning a, a sacred smoke has been used for thousands of years to clear the space, to, to clear negative energy. Um, but what it does for us and in our body is it grounds us. It helps us ah, take a deep breath and really get into our body and, and it clears the mind. And so that in itself is such a powerful tool for entering a conversation that might be difficult or vulnerable it helps create a, a safer container. Um, something else can be lighting a candle, drinking a tea that's relaxing to the nervous system. Um, chamomile tea, you can drink a tea with you know, your partner or the person that you're gonna be having this conversation with. Holy basil, just having a moment to, to really get into the body and calm the nervous system and connect to your intention for the conversation. And then to answer your question, you know, for myself, when I am having a vulnerable, difficult conversation, I notice um, energy rising in my chest and in my breath. And sometimes if I have to say something that's difficult or really vulnerable, I notice my, my voice shaking or quivering. Um, you know, sometimes my belly feels a little nervous. Um, and so, you know, again, taking deep breaths and, and taking pause or even like putting our hands on our bodies or on the earth or asking, you know, can I have a moment and, and sharing, like, I'm feeling this is really vulnerable um, or this is really hard to say. Um, I'm just going to take a few breaths here. Um, being able to communicate that, it allows for more intimacy. Yeah, I think that that... Um... 
That brings up such a great point too, is what I keep hearing you say is slow down. Slow down. So many times we feel like we have to just get it out or we feel like we just need to get this conversation rolling or get a point across or or things. And, and that's not necessarily how communication or conversation, true conscious conversation works. Um, so that's slowing down. And you also brought up a beautiful point of that these techniques and tools were all brought to us from ancient times. They were gifted to us from our earth, right? And perhaps even from, I'm going to go there, galactic beings who may have brought them to earth for us as tools when we were ready to wake up and use them. So um, yeah, that's here. And it seems what we've done is we veered so far away from what the actual communication is. I mean, I believe that we can also have nonverbal communication, right? So in that kind of communication, there are no words. And I feel like we're moving back to some of that, a lot of that in our culture, in our modern culture. So can, do you have, I know you have things to talk about with that because I am in your school. <laughs> so I'd love yeah. to hear. I love that you're bringing this in, um, nonverbal communication and communication with the non-human, right? So, you know, as far as nonverbal communication goes, we're all doing it all the time. And, and we're all very capable of doing it. You know, um, I think everyone can relate to a moment of like walking into a room and, and no one's talking, but you get this feeling of like, ooh, something, something just went down, right? So there, we can sense energy. Um, you know, this, so often someone is saying something and you might be feeling something really different. You know, you, they might be saying something with a smile and you're feeling hostility or resentment. So, you know, we're all actually very aware and I think very tuned in. Um, and it's good for us to trust ourselves. And then I think it's good for us to check in, you know, if, if it's a safe enough relationship um, and, and just say, you know, you know, I'm really feeling just some tension here. You know, is there something that you wish to communicate? Um, you know, so again, just bringing things to light, bringing things to light is always good medicine, even when it's hard. But I think the really rich thing that we can dive into is communicating with the non-human. And yes, you are one of my beautiful apprentices to the sacred wild. And what we do is we learn how to communicate with the earth. And we develop an ability to learn and understand the language of, of plants and specifically healing herbs and and plant medicines. And so um, when we embark on that journey of wanting to create relationship, intimate relationship with the earth, with the land that we live on, maybe with a tree that we're always noticing and, and just feeling some kind of affection towards, or stones, you know, some people are really drawn to the minerals and the crystals, um, animals, you know, um, there's just a whole world of beautiful, deep relationship that's possible there. And in the case of the plants, the plants have a way that they communicate what their medicinal properties are. And they communicate that through the way that they taste. They communicate that with, by showing us whether they're grounding, like if you ever drink like burdock root, or, or nettles, or whether they're very, you know, expanding, like, you know, a hot ginger tea or a peppermint tea. And so even if you have never um, thought about communicating with the plants, um, you can start to kind of notice like, oh yeah, actually, because I am made of the earth and air and water and fire, 
and the plants are made of the same elements, I can actually learn directly from them. And I can notice how they feel in my body. And I can heal myself and follow my own intuition around which plants are asking me to deepen relationship with. Yeah. And uh, okay. So one of the reasons why I chose to study with you is because all of the plants, like every, they have a, like a guide. Okay. This plant is good for this. And that herb is great for that. And this will help your blood pressure. This will help your eczema or whatever, right? What you're talking about though, in the conversation with the plant is that it can be reciprocal, right? So not only are you smelling it, you're feeling it on the outside, you can see it. So you see different um, behaviors, you see the way that it is, you see how it grows, you see where it grows. Um, and, and that's a part of listening. And then you feel where it goes in your body. And then you have this personal relationship, right? And so even though burdock may be really good for grounding, say burdock to you, not only is it good for grounding, but it makes you feel so secure and, and wanting to just express your self-love and all these things that maybe it's a real great heart opener for you because that's your personal relationship. And once you develop and have that conversation with a plant ally, with an essence of this earth that is made of the same essences, I love how you put that, as we are, then it does. you can't lose it. It doesn't go away, right? That is now a relation. It's just like, you know, my mailman. It's just like my teacher from third grade. It doesn't matter that that's been eons ago. I have a relationship with that person and I have a feeling and a knowing of who they are and how we share in this life together. And it's the same with plants. Mm, absolutely. I love how you spoke to that. Um, and I love how you're really emphasizing an opportunity for all of us to develop deeper trust of our own capacity, to trust what we are feeling drawn to, to trust how something feels in our body. And, you know, if, if there's ever, you know, one of the symptoms of, of, of kind of patriarchal capitalism and, and, you know, the modern world is it's constantly taking us out of our body and telling us to trust the ads, to trust, you know, whatever, the news or our feed. And, you know, we should be buying this. You need this. Oh, you have hormonal issues? Then take this. Um, our sense of, of trust and empowerment is constantly being taken away from us and displaced. And so I just love how you really spoke to the plants and their ability to have us learn and listen and hear these subtle and yet profoundly transformative effects and messages that they have just for us, because each of us are completely unique and different. And to be able to open to that deep conversation with the natural world and, and realize that every plant has a message that's just for us, it's completely life-changing. It really is. And even in like planting things, I mean, I realized that, and it, you know, I'll plant something and oh, maybe it didn't work there. And I'm like, okay, well, I guess I have some more work to do in listening, right? Because <laughs> maybe if I was not rushing or just saying, oh, it'll look pretty there, but I really did actually ask the plant and sit with the plant or the seeds of the plant, or the earth, where the plant's going to go, then perhaps it would have had more longevity, you know, or maybe it would have thrived or nourished, it had, had more nourishment there. So, yeah. and it is a practice. And that's what I really want to bring to light is that people can, um, you, but you got to start it, right? You have to start the practice in order to be able to gain the skill. And you have to stick with it. 
Yeah. <clears throat> and it is so natural and it is so accessible, you know, yes. and, and it feels like a coming home. It feels like a coming home. It brings back also a sense of wonder and magic that brings us joy and energy the way that, you know, when we were kids, the world all just felt a little bit more sparkly and, and that sparkle actually never really went away. It's just that, you know, um, we began getting conditioned and, and told that we should be productive, that we should, that this is what's important, you know, that, you know, whatever it might have been. And so to actually come back into relationship and reciprocity and, and love with the earth and, and with the natural world, it brings back a deep sense of, of wonder and joy and then health and vitality because we are more whole. We are meant to be um, nourishing all parts of ourselves and we are meant to be in these relationships with the earth that is part of us and that we are a part of. Yeah. Yes. Preach. <laughs> so um, I just want to, for a second, bring to light your school because um, the apprenticeship to the School of the Sacred Wild has, it's really helped me to find my way home to my inner knowing. And I just love the practice every month. This last year was the first year in my entire life that I can remember where I actually embraced the slowness of winter and the hibernation of winter and the darkness. And um, I was so surprised that I actually got a lot done. Everything got done. Only there was less um, like worry and strife and stress around it all. And what a beautiful way to be able to honor the rhythm of the earth. And so that's one of one of the many things that I learned from this school and your enrollment for it's a 10 month class yes, uh, course that's ongoing yep. for the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> the 10 month long apprenticeship. We begin September 9th. And um, so registrations open. Um, and yes, each month students receive a package of herbs or they can get them themselves. And we drink these herbs together and the herbs connect you to the energy of what is happening in the earth. So, you know, like you said, in the winter, there's more of an energy of hibernation and the plants have released their leaves and the, they're nourishing their roots. The, the winter is a good time for us to build deep immunity and deep chi so that in the spring, we actually have this effortless vitality. And so we go through the wheel of the year, connecting to the seasons, connecting to all of the kind of ever renewing cycles of nature. And throughout the 10 months, students are drinking healing herbs that target each of the chakras, each of the systems of the body. Um, and, and we have these beautiful online tea ceremonies where you are learning how to understand and hear the message directly for you from this plant. So it's a very magical and beautiful experience and just such a sweet community. The people that gather are just incredible. And um, I warmly invite anybody to join us. I not only second that invitation, I also, uh, I just can't say enough about how nourishing it is to be able to have that community to be able to come back to and even mentorship, right? So there's mentors. It's not just you. And it's, you can reach out to people around you in your area. It's all over the world. Say you travel to France. There's somebody in France who is a part of this apprenticeship. I just know it. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, it's wonderful. It's it's really great. And you don't have to go to in-person things, although that's magical. Um, you're able to be able to do it from your home, in your community, um, and be able to still find that connection to the collective and be able to regroup and ground with the parts of us that have always been available and maybe we just forgot. So, Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. And so just to recap, I want to um, say some of the tools 
that we could use for communicating with conversation is to really listen to our bodies. Um, if you have a difficult conversation that you're going to have, prepare beforehand. Allow yourself to be vulnerable uh, and transparent. Ask questions and, you know, give yourself a break and know that we're all in this together. We're all learning. We're all um, finding a way to be able to reconnect to our inner essence so that we can be made human by each other in this um, heaven on earth. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marisha, for coming on today. And I look forward to seeing you on the night and even before, I think. So, yes. <laughs> thank you, so Mahalo. Much. Thank you. Blessings to all of you and the lands you live on. Oh, I love that. And thank you to Think Tech Hawaii and all of our sponsors and donors that continue to make this platform available so that we can have these amazing conversations. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching ThinkTech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.